Hello, everyone. I'm Miguel Morel. I'm the founder and CEO of Arkham Intelligence. We are a company focused on creating de-anonymization and intelligence technology for the crypto space. Um, but today, I'm actually not going to be talking about myself or talking about um, Arkham and the kind of technology we're building. Uh, but rather, I'm going to start by giving you all a posit, which is that technology becomes government technology after it reaches a certain level of adoption. And so today's sociological sort of infrastructure and technological infrastructure uh, and, and governance infrastructure tend to all be overlaid. Uh, additionally, things move towards you know, becoming more public rather than private, and they tend to move from being super decentralized to being very centralized as they continue to scale and as they reach further adoption. So I'll start by giving one example. The slide that you see on the screen here is Christopher Columbus presenting to King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella in Spain. And the one you see here is actually Cortez landing on the American continent in 1519. And so the example that we're trying to give here is that this is actually an early instance of venture capital. Uh, and so originally, when people went on expeditions and you know, were trying to find the new world, Cortes had to make a pitch to you know, the, the, the monarch at the time, which was the Holy Roman Emperor King Charles V. Uh, and, you know, the basic pitch was that there was this large sort of piece of land in North America uh, that could be conquered and plundered, and then they could take the resources and bring them back to Europe in order to expand the empire. And so, like any kind of startup, Cortez had the job of starting with a mission and starting with a particular motivation for starting the, the, the empire. Uh, he had to go about recruiting people who would join him on his journey. He had to pitch investors, in this case, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, in order to receive funding for his expedition. And then there were particular terms about what we, he would receive in the case of success. So that would be you know, particular kinds of governance over different areas of, of, of New Spain. Um, there would be you know, a split of plunder in terms of wealth uh, and money. Some of it would go back to the empire uh, and to his original investor, and some of it would you know, stay to you know, his crew and, and to himself. Uh, and all of this is very similar to the sorts of things that you see within startups. Uh, and additionally, uh, the kinds of technology that they needed to use were ship technology. And so they needed to build and actually take in a ton of technology in order to go about executing their mission of successfully conquering New Spain. Next, we have another historical example of how you know, private technology can end up becoming government technology. So the image you see on the screen here is actually a print of a Dutch printing house. Uh, and so the example we're trying to provide here is how the printing press ended up becoming you know, a piece of very critical technology that ended up changing the history of the world. Uh, and so it started out more as a privatized technology um, that could be used by a number of different institutions and individuals, and then later on became co-opted by a number of powerful <coughs> players uh, to then try and attack one of the major institutions at the time that had a large effect on governance within Europe, the Catholic Church. Uh, and so Martin Luther uh, essentially you know, used the printing press in order to disseminate large amounts of his information uh, at scale uh, in a way that was unprecedented at the time. Previously, people would share you know, these kinds of uh, stories and arguments uh, orally uh, between one another, but once the printing press was invented, it actually allowed for mass dis distribution of information in a way that was uh, unprecedented at the time. And so the governments uh, across Europe uh, some of which had interests that were against another governing body, the Catholic Church. Uh, in this case, you had a number of different uh, German princes who were incredibly interested in limiting the power of the Catholic Church at the time, uh, continued to provide protection and provide funding uh, to Martin Luther in order to spread his, you know, this new technology of the printing press uh, and later spread their new ideology, which attacked one of their competitors, the Catholic Church at the time. Here is Luther at the Diet of Worms in 1521 before the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. Luther was condemned, but Frederick III, which was the ruler of Saxony at the time, actually negotiated for his safe release and uh, faked a highway attack uh, that then you know, led him to abduct Martin Luther and put him up in a castle that offered his uh, protection. In this case, we'll be talking about a Franciscan monk, Fra Luca 
Pacioli, a friend of Leonardo da Vinci, the, and this person is the creator of double entry bookkeeping. And so double entry bookkeeping and accounting in general was a piece of new methodology and a piece of new technology that allowed businesses to continue to scale uh, and reach you know, large advances uh, in their sort of capitalistic nature. And so modern accounting actually you know, uh, changed the way in which people did uh, uh, ma mathematics uh, with businesses and actually allowed them to evolve uh, to another sort of level. And so previously, and this is actually kind of difficult to think about in our modern world, um, people did not you know, do double entry accounting. And so you would not have you know, one centralized place in which you would see all of the inflows and all of the outflows of your business. Instead, they kept multiple books, places where they stored their revenues, places where they stored uh, their losses, where they stored their sales. There were a number of different ways uh, in which you would actually keep all the accounting, but it wasn't all in one centralized place. Uh, and for anyone who has run any kind of large institution or large business that is you know, taking in significant amounts of capital, this is one of the things that is most critical to ensuring your survival and being able to practically understand how you can use your financial capabilities in order to scale your company and scale your business. And so the invention of this sort of more centralized uh, uh, accounting and, cent uh, and accounting technology actually allowed for the expansion of a number of different businesses uh, and a number of different governments. In this case, we have the example of the Medici family, which you know, basically were the founders of a lot of modern banking and a lot of modern uh, banking and business practices uh, and were incredibly powerful at the time uh, in Italy. But not all tech is, you know, comes from government and also not all tech is necessarily, you know, ancient. We have a bunch of contemporary examples as well that I think will, you know, uh, land a bit more solidly than some of the historical examples uh, in order to show everybody the transition from private technology that can later be used as government technology. The first example that we'll give is Facebook. Uh, and so Facebook is an example of what I just described in that Facebook actually is, you know, there's a couple different ways of thinking about it. The sort of modern way and contemporary and normal way of thinking about Facebook is just as a social network. But from a government perspective, the way that you can think of Facebook is uh, someone created a system uh, in which everybody has opted in to providing information about themselves providing information about everybody who they are connected to, providing information about their education levels, everywhere they've ever worked, uh, and uh, all of the different locations that they have been by posting pictures or checking in location-wise, right? And so uh, what this means to say is it can be used for intelligence pur purposes and actually gathering intelligence on a number of different people uh, who have all opted into using Facebook and publishing their information online. So one of the examples that, wh why this is an important example is because, you know, the government is very competent and, you know, is able to do a lot of things. Um, but I think that most people would agree that if the government tried to create a centralized database of multiple billions of people where they had complete information on who they were, everybody that they were connected to, every location they've ever been to, uh, and all of their different associations, it would cost trillions of dollars and potentially never be built in the first place, or at least it would take a very, very long time. But in the case of Facebook, it was actually just a couple of different college students who you know, stumbled upon this new idea, received an initial 500,000 in venture funding, and then managed to scale it up to billions of people in a way that created a vast intelligence network that is then used by, for example, entities such as the NSA. And this is the NSA headquarters, which you see here, based in Maryland. And so the NSA and a number of different uh, intelligence agencies uh, you know, it's been exposed that they have metadata collection programs where they, you know, basically pull information from a number of different social networks. And they are able to now, because of Facebook, they now have the capability of having a queryable, searchable database of everybody, all of their affiliations, uh, all of the locations that they have been to, their education, their workplace, so on and so forth. And this is incredibly powerful technology for the government. The next example that we have is Amazon. Uh, and Amazon is a good example of something that started out privatized and later on sort of became a key piece of uh, government infrastructure for actually a variety of different reasons. The first is how you think about Amazon traditionally as the kind of thing that actually delivers packages and goods to your home. So Amazon managed to scale from a small online bookstore to the everything store and is the kind of service that you know, the majority of people in this room, including myself, 
tend to use at least, on, if not on a weekly basis, uh, potentially even on a daily basis. And in most cases is actually more important than the government courier services. I use Amazon more than I would use USPS or more than people here in the UK might use something like the Royal Mail. And those are things that are very critical pieces of infrastructure. Being able to deliver mail is a critical piece of infrastructure for governments worldwide. And so Amazon in surpassing the Royal Mail and surpassing the USPS uh, in terms of just general usage uh, by the normal populace has become a core piece of logistical and shipping infrastructure for a number of countries worldwide. And if Amazon were to collapse or somebody were to attack Amazon supply chain infrastructure, that might be a more critical national security threat than if somebody actually tried to attack something like the United States Postal Service. The second piece of infrastructure, which is uh, created by Amazon and used by governments, is actually AWS. And so AWS started as you know, a small project internally within Amazon, was later used for privatized reasons in order to give corporations and institutions the ability to do cloud computing uh, cheaply, safely, and very effectively. And then later on, again, was co-opted by the government. And so the picture that you see here is the government communications headquarters here in England, uh, which is the place where uh, uh, the UK does the majority of its metadata and mass surveillance uh, of uh, a number of people uh, globally. Uh, and so this uh, uh, GCHQ actually has uh, multi hundred billion dollar contracts with uh, sorry, multi hundred million dollar contracts with AWS. Uh, the NSA recently signed a $10 billion contract with AWS. Uh, another piece of public information is that the CIA uh, has signed multi hundred million dollar contracts with AWS. And AWS is basically the place in which the government stores all of its metadata and information and intelligence that it gathers uh, uh, domestically and it gathers internationally. And so in this way, AWS has become a core piece of infrastructure for government technology and governments being able to maintain their power. So the next question is, have cryptocurrencies reached the threshold at which they become GovTech? And my answer to that is yes. So, you know, there's kind of this broader question of, you know, how crypto will interact with governments uh, and governance structures more generally. Um, there's a lot of talk about this, but I'm going to highlight a particular framework in which we can sort of think about these ideas. Uh, an important aspect of this is, you know, the fact that there are a couple of different outcomes. The first is what we call circumvention. And so this basically means crypto as a separate entity from the traditional financial system. Uh, and this is currently the way in which crypto is structured, uh, where you know, the majority of people in the space basically consider it not to be integrated with the traditional financial system. This is how the origin of crypto started as a uh, proposed alternative uh, to the traditional financial system. And this is the way in which crypto is used uh, uh, currently. The next outcome is suppression. So this, is, this comes after the broader existence and adoption of crypto uh, and essentially means, you know, the financial system itself effectively, you know, banning crypto and replacing it with its own version. And then the next is integration. And this is essentially the crypto system being incorporated into the traditional financial system more broadly. And I'll give some examples and go more in depth in a second. So here we have an example of circumvention of the traditional financial system. From left to right, you can see the Uniswap logo, which is a decentralized exchange. In the middle, we have Tornado Cash, which is a mixer for Ethereum products in which you can hide your activity across the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, and then on the right, you have Curve, which is a way of actually you know, receiving yields and getting loans and so forth uh, within the crypto space. And so circumvention itself uh, has been uh, one of the ways in which people use the cryptocurrency system. In the case of Uniswap, people try to avoid things like KYC or logging into a centralized exchange such as Binance or Coinbase in order to get easy access to uh, other types of uh, uh, cryptocurrencies without necessarily needing to do that uh, in a way that is uh, very centralized. In the case of Tornado Cash, people are trying to obfuscate the technology of these decentralized public ledgers. So they're essentially trying to hide their activity on the, uh, on the Ethereum blockchain uh, in order to you know, have people not be able to track them in the future. And then on the right, you have Curve, which is you know, basically a DeFi decentralized fin finance uh, way of getting access to 
the kinds of services that you might see, for example, from a bank, right? And so being able to get access to yields or being able to get access to uh, loans without, again, going through some kind of intensive KYC identification regulatory process, but rather just being able to do it based on the merits of your own blockchain collateral. Next, we have the example of suppression. So here we have uh, the China ban on cryptocurrency. This initially started as a ban on cryptocurrency mining and then later on became a ban on exchanges and trading overall. Uh, further, even in the United States, you have you know, a ton of examples of suppression uh, in that uh, a number of different states and legislatures have passed uh, uh, different kinds of laws uh, that you know, say what is permissible with cryptocurrency activity and what is not permissible, right? And so in the case of suppression, there was a huge crackdown on the unregistered issuance of securities, as an example, right? A number of different people just kind of went about creating cryptocurrencies and different sort of networks and protocols uh, and then shilling them to investors in a way that ended up being very, very harmful. Uh, and so the government then stepped in and suppressed that activity, banning the ability to do things such as ICOs. And then the last is actually integration. Uh, and so in this case, we have a couple of examples of exchanges, which are key pieces of infrastructure in the crypto space, uh, and how they are working to actually strengthen their KYC and sort of overall regulatory framework in order to be in compliance with the government and their demands. Uh, and so Exchanges within crypto are actually another example of you know, contemporary private technologies that over time have become pieces of government technology. And so the way people got access to cryptocurrencies very early on was via mining the cryptocurrencies themselves. Uh, you, know, you can mine it on your computer, you can mine it at home. Some people even in the very early days were able to mine it on mobile devices. Um, but over time, the mining of cryptocurrency went from being decentralized in the sense that there were very, very many players who were all mining on their own individual devices to itself becoming significantly more centralized. Now, the overwhelming majority of mining is done by fewer than 10 players globally, worldwide. And so you actually have way fewer people who are you know, actually making a difference in terms of the overall mining space and mining all of these different cryptocurrencies. And so that itself is a centralizing force. Once people, individuals, could no longer compete on the mining front, they had to get access to it some other way. And that could be either peer-to-peer -peer or by buying the cryptocurrency off of some sort of website. The thing about trying to get access to crypto peer-to-peer -peer is that it might work if you're trying to get access to, say, $10 worth of Bitcoin, but it's very, very difficult if you want to do it at scale and, say, buy $10 million worth of Bitcoin. You need some sort of network effect or liquidity pool from which you can very quickly trade in and out of your cryptocurrencies at scale, and that just can't happen via asking 1,000 different people for $1,000 worth of cryptocurrency. The easier way is actually to just go to a centralized service that has a massive liquidity pool, an existing network effect of buyers and sellers, uh, and where you can actually just participate in a market and purchase them. And so the actual purchasing of cryptocurrencies and access of cryptocurrencies moved from being able to access it from a variety of different people, you would go to and get small amounts of cryptocurrency at a time, to now there's just a small number of exchanges that really matter that have hundreds of billions of dollars worth of cryptocurrency volume on a monthly basis. And these are the places where you can actually get access to your crypto. And so exchanges are actually another way in which we can think of technologies that started off much more decentralized, much more private, and now have sort of moved towards centralization and are now very clearly trying to work with government in order to keep them happy and continue running their operation. Thank you very much.